Hi Shannon, it's great to have you in Durban, South Africa for the International Surf Lifesaving Championships as coach of the Australian national team. How's your experience been in South Africa so far? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Um, it's been a great trip. I was here in uh, 2009, we raced up the road and um, had a good experience then. I spent a couple of weeks with uh, my wife as well, traveling through South Africa and Africa after that trip. So um, I've been here before and you know, it's great to be back again um, as a coach with some, some young athletes and um, showing them different cultures from around the world, different experiences, different beaches, different foods. It's just great for the young guys to, to experience that. So it's been a good trip so far. Now, Shannon, you're one of the best sportsmen in the world. At the age of 19, you claimed an Australian title, World Ironman title, and a Kellogg's Nutrigrain series. You've gone on to win a total of 28 Australian championships, 10 world championships. You've won the Kellogg's Nutrigrain six times and have won the Australian Surf Ironman title eight times. Now, You've obviously had an amazing journey, but let's rewind back to the beginning. How did you get involved in sports? Um, just growing up in the Gold Coast, uh, my mum and dad were, were into sports. They, they swam and ran and, and paddled. Um, and my dad was a Gold Coast City Council lifeguard, so I spent a lot of time down the beach. And the Gold Coast lifestyle, um, the climate's probably similar here to Durban. It's, it's about sport and getting active and, and in, uh, down the beach as well. So I played a lot of sports when I was young at school and club, and it probably wasn't until I was probably 15, 16 that I decided that, that Nippers and Ironman was the, the one I enjoyed the most and was most passionate about and, and wanted to you know, dedicate a bit of time to. Um, I was lucky enough to spend a bit of time with your dad actually working at, uh, I think it was Mermaid Beach, and uh, you know, he gave me some tips on board paddling. You know, he said to me, because um, I didn't have any experience at that stage, he just said, you know, catch waves and ride the, the wave right to the beach, and then um, you know, paddle out. Um, you know, so, you know, your dad had a lot of experience and uh, he obviously passed that on to you. Now, at what point did you realize you could become one of the best surf ironmen? Oh, um, you know, I didn't join Nippers till under 12s and, but I spent a lot of time down the beach before that. Obviously, um, with dad being a lifeguard and a coach, um, I spent a lot of time down the beach and I actually won an under 12 state Ironman title in my, in my first year. So, I took to it like a duck to water and really enjoyed it. Um, and I had quite a bit of success early on. And when I was 15, 16, I probably hadn't grown yet. I was a bit smaller than the other guys and I had to work really hard to try and try and get up the top of the races. And then probably when I was 17, 18, I grew and and um, got rewarded for the hard work that I'd done and, and started you know, winning my age group and, and beating some older guys. And, and as you say, when I was 18, I won a World Ironman title in 2002 at Daytona Beach. And, 2003, I won the Australian Ironman title and Kellogg's title at 19. So, um, I actually remember being down there at Daytona. I was uh, I was right at the back, um, and I just you know I made the final, but um, I came probably second to last to last. Um, so yeah, you winning and all these races is absolutely incredible. Now I'm sure you've had some great drivers behind your success. Who are they, and how have they helped you achieve these incredible results? Oh, look, I think for any athlete when you're young, you, your parents are probably the ones that, that guide you. They're the ones that enable you to get to training and, and move around. So they're, they're the main ones for me that my parents um, supported me when I was younger. And it's, it's hard if you, you need to go to Sydney for a race or, or travel around Australia. It all costs money. And when you're young and at school, you, um, you know, you've got no sponsors. Your parents are your sponsors. So for them to back you and, and give you every opportunity is probably the the main guys behind it. But then when I moved on and you know the, the coaches I've had, I had Trevor Hendy um, coach me as a young athlete and I, I was a sponge when, I, when he was coaching me and I tried to learn as much as possible. I think he, he fast-tracked you know, my skills in the sport and then Dennis Cottrell was, was my swim coach for my whole career and um, there was nothing but hard work with Dennis and there was no secrets about it. You, the harder you work, the, the more success, successful you, you were. So he was a big part as well. And you mentioned uh, Trevor and Dennis. Uh, what, what, what did you learn from Trevor that you think would uh, you know, maybe benefit other you know, countries like you know, South Africa and America? We seem to be behind you in a few sports and uh, I definitely know it's lost maybe 10, 15 years we've fallen further behind. Is there anything you could offer in terms of advice and, and what you've learned from these great athletes? Oh, look, I think Trevor and Dennis are not totally opposites, but their, their programs probably complement each other in that Trevor's more of a, a probably a skills-based program. So when I was younger, there was a lot of in and out through the surf, a lot of paddle backs, um, catching runners and and working hard because as I've learned that you could swim for six months as hard as you can at training and improve 
you know your 400 time by eight seconds but if you can hold a body surfing wave to the beach you know that's 20 seconds difference so you've got to improve your skills to get everything you can out of the ocean but then you've also got to work hard to, to be the fastest you can be so those two coaches probably complemented each other and, and created that um, you know how I was performing as an Ironman. Uh, you compete in the Uncle Toby series, uh, which is considered by many as the greatest surf Ironman series. How would you describe competing the Uncle Tobys? Yeah, look, when I was growing up, um, the Uncle Tobys guys were, were kind of rock stars in Australia. They were live TV most weekends throughout the summer, and um, you know they were on Baywatch and things like that created a bit of an aura about the series. So I. Um, I was in year 12, my last year of school, and I, I competed in the trial to get in the Uncle Toby series and won that trial. Um, so I qualified for the series, and I remember my, my first race, I was at Newcastle and blowing a gale. It was so windy, and I think I came about fourth last. I came about 16th, it was, and then 12th in the next round, 9th in the next round, and then finished the series with two thirds. So that was the kind of the progression I was when I, I was 17 years old. I improved throughout the season. and. Just travelling around, being part of the Uncle Toby series was, was a bit of a dream. Why do you think the Uncle Toby series was so successful in its prime? Oh look, I think combination of promotion and marketing, um, the spend that was, was put into it, it's all about everything to do with the sport costs money and if you can promote it and market it, you, you need money to, you need marketing budgets and um, no. if you're willing to spend, you, you're going to get exposure and people are going to watch so it's kind of the chicken for the egg thing sponsors want want people to watch but you need actual money to, to get people to watch too most people know you from your success from the new terrain surf ironman series what was great about the series oh look the, the kellogg's moved on from the the uncle toby series when that folded there was two series back then that folded the kellogg's became the, the pinnacle that's both merged into it instead of 40 Ironman competing in a professional series is only 20, so it was it was very very difficult early on um, because both both merged together and um, I enjoyed travelling around Australia and those that professional series was when you earned your money you, you paid paid your bills pretty much so you had to perform in that and at the end of the day I won nine professional series um, finished on the podium every year except my last year where I tore my calf so the consistency in that professional series um, was great because. The, the races vary so much from a 12 minute sprint to you know a couple of hours endurance race so now, the... in, in my experience uh, in South Africa we had a surf Ironman series that lasted for about three four years um, and you know due to a number of reasons it stopped um, and then we went through about a 10 year period where there was no surf Ironman series in your opinion what is the key ingredient to a successful surf Ironman series oh uh, you got to start off with passionate people that, that want to drive it. Um, if you've got no one passionate people with the, the time and energy um, to really go off, because it's, it's very hard to get off the ground to get sponsors and, and TV and media behind it, get the athletes behind it, get the, the cities behind it. it, it's very, very difficult. So you need, you need you know, to dedicate a couple of years to try to, to get things off the ground. It takes time, energy, and um, you've, got to, you've got to have the right support. Now, uh, moving on to training, your brother Kane has also been a, a part of your sporting career. In what way has your brother been influential on your sporting career? Yeah, growing up, Kane's a couple of years younger than me, um, so he's a very, very good trainer. And for a few years there, we'd, we wouldn't miss a session. We'd go head to head um, at training all the time, and just that competitive effort in training um, really, really, you know, improved us both in our racing so I think that's a big key to find someone that you can train with and really push each other at training it wasn't about you know beating each other every day it was about getting the our best out of both of us at training and that's what, what improved us both I know you have formerly retired from competitive surf Ironman racing so you're not training as much as you used to however at your best what did your standard training week include yeah, at, um, I think in Australia everyone's pretty similar with our, with our programs. We swim about four mornings a week and that varies from five and a half to six and a half kilometres. Um, another two mornings a week we'll do an Ironman session down the, boot, down the beach. And then five afternoons, probably three a ski, two a board sessions. One of each would be in the canal, flat water, and the other ones would be in the surf, whether it's a, a paddle back to start the week on a Monday, say 15 to, to 18 kilometer paddle back, and then some interval stuff during the week. But um, we also do a bit of gym, maybe a long run, and then a track running session. And that's the all week. in one week? 
All in one week, yeah. Right. We, we train anywhere, you know, 12 to 15 times a week and usually train Saturday morning and then have a day and a half off before you get back in the pool Monday. How have you been able to be so consistent over the years? Um, I don't know. I, I never really had any major injuries till the last couple of years where I got a few niggles, but I've always looked after myself, trained hard. Uh, I've never put too much pressure on myself. I've always been, been pretty laid back, and I think that's sort of helped. I've been pretty composed, and I know where where Ironman sits in my life. You've got so many other things going on, so many other important things going on that you know, Ironman doesn't sit at the top of them, but it's a, it's a big part of, of what I do. And um, there's always other things in your life going on. That, but Ironman's been important, but it hasn't been the be all and, and an end all. So I think that sort of made it. I've been able to take the pressure off. And what's your approach to preventing injury? Well, there's there's lots of things you can do to prevent injury. Um, you know, the right training programs, the right training load, the right progression in your load. It's not about coming back from a break and. You know, doing your biggest week of the year, it's it's all about you know looking after your body and progressing the training load, um, and also sports science as well that's come a long way. There's there's the little things like ice bath and massage, drinking and eating right, um, all those these things might only be one two percent, but they all add up and they all allow you to, to get back into training earlier, to do a better training session earlier, and that's going to improve your racing. I know since uh, I was in Australia for 10 years and uh, came back to South Africa six years ago and um, from coaching other athletes um, uh, it's been quite frust frustrating to say the least. Um, what are some common training mistakes that you see that are made by inexperienced athletes? Um, probably one of the big ones is going too hard too early. It's all about progression. Um, I think it's better to, to you know, do a six to eight session week consistently for two months then to come out and do 18 sessions for two weeks and then break down and get injured so it's all about balancing it but um, you got to know your body as well and, and listen to your body your body can take a bit um, you know just because you got the sniffly nose or something doesn't mean you might you don't have to go training but you just got to look after yourself and um, and so you get your best out of yourself uh, what do you hate seeing in training in terms of ethos? Cause, uh... <laughs> oh, look, I've, over the years, it's different people train different ways, but I, I don't like, you know, the ones that save it to the end of the session. If you go in 10 hard 100s, you don't like a guy dropping five seconds on his last one. I always think your second last one should be your max one, and then, you know, your last one, it's a bit, you, you're pretty shot, and it shouldn't be your fastest one. So I always... You know, laugh at the guys that think they they're getting benefit by you know, doing nine easy and one hard. It's you're not getting benefit. You might get your ego might get a bit of a kick along, but it's not going to benefit your um your race. What are some false beliefs that you have about training? False beliefs. Um, I think it's there's a balance there. The you know it, there is a point you you got to work hard and, and do a lot of kilometres, but there is a tipping point that you can work too hard as well. So. It's about getting that sweet spot in the middle. There's obviously, when you're not training, that's not good enough, and there's a point where it's too much for your body to handle. So it's all about creating that sweet spot. Um, in, your po in your opinion, what should you eat as an athlete? Because there's so much out there um, from so many different people, but to hear it from you, who's, who's been there and done that, is one of the greatest in the sport. Um, what should you eat? Oh, I think, it's again, it's pretty balanced. I, I, like to have eggs, eggs on toast for breakfast with bacon, maybe avocado. Um, I'll have probably three or four pieces of fruit a day, whether right? it's banana or apples, mandarins, oranges, uh, sandwiches for lunch. You know, chicken sandwich or something like that. And I'm, I'm meat and sort of meat and three veg for dinner. Meat, sweet potato, corn, broccoli. Um, my wife, you know, thinks we're pretty bland if I keep having that when I was training. But that that sort of simple stuff's the the way to go. I'm not a big night before, a big pasta guy or anything like that. I'm pretty just normal meat and free veg. So are you saying uh, your, your diet shouldn't change before racing or um, just maybe elaborate a, a little bit on the difference between the training diet and then the, the pre-race diet? Yeah, I think my, my pre-race diet is pretty similar to, to what I've been doing. Uh, it's just clean, healthy, healthy eating really. Um, 
and that's what's what's helped me throughout my career. It's I've never really gone away from that too much. What about sugars? Yeah, um, I don't tend to, to drink. You know, when I'm training, drink soft drink or anything like that. I might, um, you know, treat yourself to ice cream or, or something like that on a on a Saturday night. But um, yeah, you, I'm, it's all common sense, really. Everyone knows deep down what's what right and wrong is. Um, it's just making the right choices, really. Okay, in terms of uh, mental approach, um, when you're standing on the line before a major race, uh, what's going through your mind? And, and maybe actually, let's even take that another maybe 10 minutes before the race. Because um, I think the problem that I've seen with a few athletes, uh, especially in South Africa, is they get distracted. I mean, what, what sort of can you suggest or what goes through your mind uh, in terms of that just pre-race approach and how to get into the zone? Yeah, I think everyone everyone is different. You got to go with what works for you. you need, we see guys with headphones on listening to music to pump them up. I, I just sit back and usually watch the girls race before mine and, and look, watch the conditions, talk to my, my coach or handler and I'm pretty calm really. I think I never really waste energy getting worked up before I race. I, I know that once the gun goes I'm going to be ready to go because I've done it so many times. So, And I've trained for it and prepared for it and that gives you the confidence that, that I'm not scared of the result. Um, I've never been scared of losing, and so there's nothing wrong with with getting beaten. So it's no for me. There's no point getting getting worked up or nervous or, or scared of the result. I've prepared the best you can go, and um, you're either going to go out there and win or you're not, um, and that's that's what's going to happen. So you may as well just relax and, and let it come. Now, when a race goes wrong, um, how do you deal with setback? Oh, I think it's always important to learn from your mistakes. So. If you've chosen the wrong line in a race or you've done the wrong thing, it's important not to do that again. Um, and then also, especially in our sport, if some people might have won a race and think, oh, I'm swimming really well, but they've come from 10th on a wave and so they weren't the fastest swimmer. But, so it's important to, to actually sit down with yourself and go, well, I did win and I'm pretty, pretty stoked about that, but I was coming 10th. So I need to work on my swim leg and I've got to do that because next time, might not get that wave so it's important to be real with yourself and and know where you're at now let's talk about the future of surf ironman racing there's recently been some resistance towards surf lives of australia for their decision to change professional surf on and racing by incorporating other disciplines what are your thoughts on this yeah it's interesting um honestly i'm, I'm glad i'm probably retired because of some of the stuff that that's um you know being proposed i probably wouldn't have enjoyed but I'm never going to knock anyone for, for having a go and having ideas and, and whether they work or not, I'm unsure of. But what I, what I do know is, you know, surf life saving, especially in Australia and Ironman racing, is, um, is going really well. We just, just need to, you know, everyone get behind it. And we had 110 people do the trial to get into the Kellogg's this year. Um, I know at my club, Nippers, is um, just been, just Nippers sign-ons, the most we've had in the last 20 years. So, you know, everything's not all doom and gloom. It's um, it's about you know, promoting what we've got, and that's great, great athletes, great beaches, healthy people, and, um, and getting behind us. Now, in terms of um, offering advice to up-and-coming athletes, do you have any advice for aspiring sportsmen? Oh, for, for young guys, I think it's important to, to play as many sports as you can when you're young, uh, especially when you're 10, 11, 12, 13. You know, play as many sports as you can, because all, all as you can, because all the skills you learn um, are gonna gonna help you later on if you do choose a sport. I think so. Um, that's what I I did when I was younger, and I think it, it really helped you. You know, your hand-eye coordination and your your fitness if you go for a run and, or you play a soccer game. All those things help you later on in life. Then I think when you do pick something that you really want to do, you've got to be as dedicated as anyone else in the sport because if you're if you're not as dedicated as as um, everyone else then you're going to get left behind so i think if you do choose something then you got to do it 100 percent otherwise you won't get the results if you could give advice to the younger shannon Eckstein, what would it be <laughs> um, i'm not sure i'm pretty pretty stoked with um with how things ended up in in my ironman career so I, I did learn a lot throughout my career and I think that was largely to do to training with older guys like Trevor Hendy and when I was younger. So what advice I'd give, um, you know, probably my, later on in my career I enjoyed it a lot more than when I was younger. When I was 20 to 23, 
I had a big target on my back and there was a lot of pressure because I was expected to, to win every race and it probably, you know, my love for the sport probably wasn't there because I just felt that everyone was out to get me, everyone wanted to beat me. So when I was in, later on in my career, that sort of died away and I, I embraced that and enjoyed people wanting to beat me. But when, I, when you, you're the, the target, it's, it's quite tough. Lastly, what does the future hold for Shannon next time? Oh, I'm, I'm enjoying doing a little bit of ocean ski paddling at the moment. I had a few months off after the Australian titles in April and just getting getting fit at the moment. So I'll probably ski paddle, whether it fits in a couple of times a week and lock in a race in Hong Kong and the doctor in Perth at the end of this year and, um, and go from there. But I, I am working in, in property development full time as well now. So I'm enjoying that as well. So just fit in training around that. Shannon, it was great chatting to you today. Uh, we've loved having you in South Africa and we wish you the best of luck for the future. Awesome, cheers.